Amen. That, that song ought to make your heart move a little bit quicker than it was at the beginning of the song. What a tremendous thought that one day he's coming and we'll all shout that's him. I appreciate her singing that song today. Thank you, Brenda. This is our fifth sermon in this series on our great God, talking about his character, his nature, those things that you and I ought to know. We call those things that mark him and him only, his attributes, the holy attributes of our great God. He is infinite, which means we'll never fully understand him, but there are those things that are revealed in his word that we are responsible uh, to know. Um, One of his attributes, by the way, is his incomprehensibility. It's just you can't come to the end of understanding God. There's a verse in Psalm chapter 145 and verse 3. It says, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable. That means you're not going to come to the end of defining God's greatness. There was a Roman statesman and philosopher uh, and author, and his name was Cicero. Cicero told the, the fable of a king who asked a poet to define for him the greatness of God. The poet asked if he could have a day and, come and, and contemplate that, and he'd come back the next day. So the next day the poet came back to the king, and he asked the king, for two more days. He said, may I contemplate on the greatness of God two more days? And he did. He gave him that extension. He came back after two days and he asked for four more days. And at the end of four days, he asked for eight more days. And at the end of eight days, he asked for 16 days. And on the 31st day, the poet come before the king and, and, and the, and the, uh, The king asks him, why do you keep asking for more time? And the poet's reply was, because the longer I deliberate and ponder on the greatness of God, the more obscure the matter seems to me. It doesn't matter how many days he gave him, he was not going to be able to fully define the greatness of God. And so there is that aspect there, but there are certain things in the word of God that God has chosen to reveal about himself that we can know. And our intent in in these these weeks that we're going through this series, our intent is to get to know God better. Knowing God. Paul said this when he wrote wrote to the Philippian church. He said in chapter 3, I think it's in verse number 10, he said one of his heart's desires was that I may know him. And so what we can know about God, we ought to do our best to learn. Because what we can know about him are going to help us, especially in days of trial and hardship and uncertainty. Can we fully explain him? No. But what we can know about him is for our benefit. It's not just because God's an egomaniac that wants to tell the world about himself. He wants us to know him so that he can sustain us through circumstances that we don't always relate well to on our own. The more we know about this God. So I'll ask you to turn to Exodus chapter 3 this morning. It's near the beginning of your Bible. And this is one of those theophanies in Scripture. We're talking about today the God who is. And I'm going to take that title from a verse that we're going to read. A theophany in the, in the Bible is one of the appearances where God manifests himself. It's a manifestation of God's presence, especially in the Old Testament. By studying the theophanies, those manifestations of God, by studying the names of God and the redemptive works of God, we come to better know him. His manifestations, or the theophanies, his names, which are all through scripture, and then the redemptive works that we also see all through scripture. By knowing those three things, we know him better. In Exodus chapter 3, all three of those things converge to help us to know some things about God. You have God manifested in the burning bush. This is a story, if you didn't know it, Exodus 3 is the story of Moses at the burning bush. First of all, you have a manifestation of God in the burning bush. And then in this text, God is going to tell Moses his name. What is his name revealed in this? Do you remember? I am that I am. One name, bunch of words, 
I am that I am. And then you also have God's redemptive works being revealed here because he's going to tell Moses about his plan to deliver Israel from Egypt. So all of those things that we should be studying to get to know God are going to be in this text today. Um, let's, let's just read to get a running start on it. How about chapter 3, verse number 1? Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock back to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land, and a large, unto a land that floweth with, or flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I? that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt. And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee, that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. Well, let's stop right there for a moment. God tells Moses who he is, and, and I'm, the, I'm the God of your father, and the God of all the patriarchs, and my plan is to bring Israel out of Egypt, and my plan is to use you to do it, he says. And then Moses starts asking questions. He asks that question uh, there in verse number 11, and then he resumes in verse number 13. Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel... And shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of, and the God of Jacob, hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. We'll just stop right there for now. Most Hebrew scholars say that in that question that Moses asks there in verse number 13, he's asking for more than God's name. He knows God's name. He's asking for the meaning of it. When he says, what is your name? He's asking him, what does your name mean? The, the Greek translation of the Old Testament is called the Septuagint. It says, I am that I am, reads, I am he who exists. It's just a statement of who God is. God's just saying, uh, I, I, I am. He doesn't have to go back to a beginning because he can't. So we're going to look at this today and, and see what God is saying, this God who is. What is he telling Moses to tell the children of Israel? What is he saying to us today in the revelation of his name here? Because he says in verse, uh, verse number 16, the last one, that re, uh, or 15 rather, the last one we read, this is my name forever. This is my memorial unto all generations. So that includes you and I. You and I ought to know 
what about this name we need to know. Dr. Tozier, A.W. Tozier, said everything that God is, everything that is God, is set forth in this unqualified declaration of independent being. I am that I am. I like that phrase, don't you? Unqualified declaration of independent being. I'd like us to look this morning at three wonderful but mysterious truths about that particular name, this God who has revealed himself to Moses. And I want, I want it to impact us, not just for Bible knowledge. I don't want this to be a theology class, although this, this verse and its surrounding verses they are the topic of theology classes in Bible colleges and seminaries. I don't want this to be a Bible college or seminary class. What you and I need is to have this truth and then to be able to do something with it. What do I do with the fact that I serve a God who is self-existing, who's eternally faithful, who's always good? What do I do with that knowledge? So that's what I hope to leave you with today. Let's pray and ask God to help us with our understanding. We're talking about deep things here. Um, Quite frankly, and I'll confess this to you at the beginning, but don't get up and leave, they're beyond my ability to fully explain. I don't have the knowledge nor the vocabulary to do that. This is an infinite God, and we're talking about infinite attributes, but what we can know about our God, we're responsible to know. So let's do that this morning. Father, we come to your word, and we have to come humbly because the natural man doesn't receive these things. We need the Holy Spirit to be our guide into all truth. These things require us, Lord, to think and to ponder upon you, to meditate on your greatness and the depth of the, of the being that you are. You're not a man. You're not someone who's fully explainable. Lord, there are things we're never going to know about you because you're infinite and we're not. But you have told us some things in here, and you have revealed yourself in different ways. And Lord, we want, like Moses requested, we want to see your glory. We want to see it revealed in this church. We want to see it revealed in our homes. We want to see it revealed in our lives so that people will look at us, see Christ, and come to you. Lord, none of this knowledge is going to help us if it doesn't change the way we live. And so help us to come before your word today and submit ourselves to the work of the Holy Spirit. Teach us things about you. Certainly, we want to remember these. We want to increase our knowledge of your word. But, Lord, more than that, we want to know you. And so help us to do that uh, in ways that we can't do ourselves. We pray in your name. Amen. Let's jump right into it. In verse number 14, let's start there. And we're going to talk about three things that mark this God. Here's the first one. God is eternal in his self-existence. God is eternal in his self-existence. There's two, there's two aspects of God's being I want us to see in this. Number one, I want us to see his self-existence. That kind of goes without saying, doesn't it? God is eternal in his self-existence. Let's talk about that name. There's a theological name for that. If you want to impress your friends, uh, there's a, if you want to impress, impress your friends when you start talking about God, you can use the word aseity, A-S-E-I-T-Y. That refers to the self-existence of God, the aseity of God. R.C. Sproul said this about this particular doctrine. I put the quote up because sometimes I think when I read it, you may get lost in my reading and you may be more visual than audio. Sproul said in that one little word, talking about aseity, in that one little word is captured all of the glory of the perfection of God's being. What makes God different from you and different from me and different from the stars, the earthquakes, and any creaturely thing is that God and God alone has a seity. God and God alone exists by his own power. He is a self-existent God. He, is, he, he has always existed. One theologian called him, I, I thought this was good, called him the uncaused cause. He's self-existent. He has life of himself. He depends upon himself for existence. I'm repeating the same thing in different ways because he's the only one that can claim any of this. He's the only self-existing being. 
a perfect example of what it means to be a seer or, or self-existing is this burning bush. The burning bush is a good example of this. Moses sees this bush burning, and it's, it must be in a distance. He says, I'm going to turn off the regular path here. I'm going to turn off, and I'm going to go see this bush over here because the bush is on fire, but the bush is not on fire. There, there's a fire there, but the bush is not being burned. I'm going to go look at this. Here's how this demonstrates the self-existing God. The bush burned, or the fire rather, burned without using the bush as fuel. The fire's just there, but the bush is not being consumed. The fire is a self-existing fire. You and I can't, we can't produce that. This can't, and not just you and I, people smarter than you and I can't produce it. They don't have a fire that will burn without fuel. But this bush was. This bush was burning all on its own, but not being consumed. There's never been another fire like this, I don't think, on the planet. Where a fire exists, but nothing is being consumed. That's a wonderful example of the self-existing God. He's not dependent on anything in order for him to be. He is the God who is. He, he, just, he just is. The I am language that we read here in verse number 14, that language is found all through the scripture. There's a bit of it, in, especially in Isaiah chapter 40 uh, through chapter 48. You'll find a lot of these things in here. Let me, just, let me just share with you some examples. You can turn there or you can write them down, whatever you want to do. Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 6 says, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and the last. Besides me, there is no God, period. That's the end of a sentence. I am the first and the last. There is no God besides me. Isaiah chapter 48, verses 12 and 13. Hearken unto me, O Jacob and Israel, my called. I am he. I am the first. I also am the last. Mine hand hath laid the foundation of the earth. My right hand hath spanned the heavens. When I call unto them, they stand up together. God, the eternal, everlasting creator of everything that is. He's the self-existing God. He is the God who is. That same thought carries over. You remember the beginning of our Revelation study. Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 8. I am, now it's in red letters, Jesus is speaking. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. The self-existent God is absolutely and utterly independent from everything else for his existence. There's nothing that can say that. Nothing. No person can say that. He's completely and only dependent on himself. The first aspect of God's being in Exodus 3 here is his self-existence. And then I want you to see also his eternality. His eternality. He is the eternally existing God. Let me say it like this. He exists in the past. He exists in the present. He exists in the future. And he does all of that at the same time. This is where the circuit breakers start to flip off and you've got to reset them. Simultaneously existing past, present, and future. This is wrapped up in that thought I am that I am. I exist now. I exist in the past. I already exist in the future. He is the eternally existing God. Isaiah chapter 40, verse number 28. The everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. Psalm chapter number 90, verses 1 and 2. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting, going that way, 
to everlasting going that way, the psalmist says this, thou art God. That art, a present tense verb. From everlasting that way, you are God. From everlasting that way into the future, you are God. He's present, past, present, and future. There are three things that, that, that's involved in, in his eternality. And they're simple to see. Number one is this. God has no beginning. I don't know how to explain this, but there never is a time when God was not. He just doesn't have a beginning. He exists in eternity past. There is not a place in the history of anything that exists where you will not find God. He is the God who is. He has no beginning. God has no end. There has never been a time when God will not exist. There never will be a time when God does not exist. That, that humanist that in the, the 1800s declared that God is dead, he is wrong. He's wrong. That, that humanist is not even dead now. He's existing. Everyone lives somewhere forever, but that is... That truth is absolutely true of God. He is the God who exists. He has no beginning. He has no end. We can't, we can't fathom that. We have a hard enough time thinking God has no beginning, but we can't fathom that God has no end. And the reason is because everything you and I see is ruined by time. We're locked into it. We are locked into seconds and minutes, or we're locked into months and years. Some of us, now you're locked into decades. We're counting longer periods of time, right? I heard somebody say something about, uh, what did I see on Facebook? Said something the other day about, um, I heard somebody refer back to the 80s, and it dawned on me that's now 40 years ago. You're like, wow, that passed quick. We can't fathom, we can't fathom that God has no end because everything we see is ruined by time. So how can God exist? He's going to wear out eventually. He's not. The sun is eventually going to run out of fuel. It, it's a, our star, it's eventually just going to quit burning. God will never run out. He has no beginning. He has no end. And then this kind of wraps those two thoughts up. God has no boundary in time. Pastor, what does all this have to do with me? I'll get to it. But I'm, what I'm trying, to get, I'm trying to get you to the place where I was when put, studying this week, I'm trying to get you to the place where you're a bit confused. How can something not have a beginning and something not have an end and something not be bound? How can God not be bound by time? You see, over the course of time, hopefully, you and I, as months and years pass, hopefully you and I are learning things. Hopefully you're growing in wisdom and in knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hopefully you are improving. I hope that you know more of the Bible today than you did last year. I hope, you know, I hope you're better at your job this year than you were last year. I hope you're growing and improving. Our existence is filtered through time. If someone asks you how old you are, they're asking how long you have existed. Our very existence depends on that clock that's chiming right now. God has no experience like that at all. God does not grow. God does not learn. God does not improve. Time has no impact on who God is and what God is. I'm, I'm getting older. You're getting older. Things are changing. Hopefully our minds are improving because the older we get, our bodies don't do that. They don't do that quite well. God doesn't experience any of that. Let, let me, let me, God, God is above time. How, how can we say that? So we'll watch a football game. We'll watch a football game in four 15-minute quarters. We'll watch the first quarter, then the second quarter, then a worthless halftime show, then a third quarter, then a fourth quarter. Or we'll go to a parade. 
and we'll find hopefully a front row seat at that parade. Nobody's, nobody's in front of us. I'm a little vertically challenged. So hopefully when I go to a parade, somebody six and a half feet tall doesn't stand in front of me. But I get to the parade and I, I get there and I get up on the edge of the sidewalk so nobody can get in front of me. And then I watch that parade as it passes by me. I know what's gone past, but I don't know what's coming. When I'm watching the football game, I watch that football game in four 15-minute quarters. God sees that whole game at the same time. God sees that entire parade at the same time, not just what is passing in front. He sees the end from the beginning, all at the same time. This is related to God's omnipresence in time. He's, he's everywhere present. We limit that in our pea brain thinking sometimes. When I talk to you about the omnipresence of God, the doctrine that says God is everywhere at the same time, you and I equate that with, well, God is, God is with us right now here in Jefferson City, and God is with Brother David Peach down there ministering right now in Peru, and that is true. But God is also omnipresent in the past and in the future. He's not bound by time. You serve a great God. You serve a great big God. The universe will not contain God. He does not have a boundary by any time. He has no beginning. He has no end. He is the eternally existing God. He has always known the beginning from the end. Think, are you thinking about that? I see smoke coming out some of your ears, so I know the wheels are turning. This is what is referred to in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8 when it says, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. It doesn't make a bit of difference to God. Now, a day in a thousand years, that's everything to me, but not to God. He's not bound by that time. Psalm chapter 90 and verse 4 says, For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night, a part of the night, a thousand years. He's not being direct here. He's not, the, not Peter and not the psalmist in Psalm 90. Neither of them are saying, okay, a thousand years equals one day with God. That's not what he's saying. He's saying time doesn't matter. He's the eternally existing God. This is how God declares the end from the beginning, his foreknowledge, his omniscience. It's all dependent on the fact that he eternally exists, past, present, and future. He knows all that there is to know here. That's confusing, isn't it? Why would I take 15 minutes today to talk to you about that this morning? What does this self-existence of God mean to us? It means this. You don't know one thing about tomorrow. But the God you serve and the God that loves you does. You can trust him. This self-existence, it's a lot of theology. Boy, it's a lot of, it's a lot of, of brain work. All you need to know is what you don't know about the future, God does, and he's already there. He self-exists in the past, in the present, and in the future. We can rest in that fact. So how do I respond to it then? The psalmist says again in verse number 90, or, or chapter number 90 of the book of Psalms, verse 12, God, you're self-existent. A thousand years is like a day. It doesn't mean anything. You're the God who always is, always was, always will be. What does that mean to be? Psalm 90, 12. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. We are confessing our submission to God's eternal perspective and our absolute dependence on him. You don't know what's coming tomorrow. You can't. I can't. God does rest in that fact. First thing is this, God is eternal in his self-existence. He didn't say, well, I'm the God who's always been. He just said, I am. I am. Number two, God is unchangeable in his being and character. Unchanging in his being and character. This is the, the doctrine of immutability. The root word there being mutate or change. God doesn't. God doesn't mutate. God doesn't change. 
He is the unchangeable God. Verse number 15, God's revealing himself to Moses. And this is what he says in verse number 15. We're still in Exodus 3. God said, moreover to Moses, thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me unto you. This is my name forever. This is my memorial unto all generations. What we need to remember here is God's name is tied to who he is. And he's saying, this is my name or this is who I am forever. I'm not going to change. His name tied to who he is. Think of all those, you know, the, we've done studies before. The Jehovah names of God that you find throughout the scripture. Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Rapha. You have all of those names that describe God's person. God is saying this. My name is not going to change. What he's telling you is, he's not going to change. He's not going to change. He's not going to change at all. He's the same all the time. I wish I could be like that. I I just wish I could be like that. The same all the time. My kids probably wished when they were younger that I could be the same all the time. That... I wish dad wouldn't be moody at certain times. God is just, he's just God. He's the God who is. He's the God who here doesn't change. First of all, his nature is unchanging. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6, God said, For I am the Lord, it doesn't get any plainer than this. Do you remember that verse? For I am the Lord, I change not. That's That's fairly easy to understand right there. A bunch of one-syllable words. I get that. What's he saying? I don't change. He's unchanging in his nature. God's immutability is a vitally important doctrine because it marks the difference between being and becoming. Between the creator and the creature. God is never becoming. He's never becoming. He doesn't change. Hopefully, I am becoming more like Jesus. And hopefully, you are becoming more like Jesus. That's God's plan for us in Romans 8, 29. God's never going to become anything. He he doesn't change. His nature is unchanging. As his creation, we continually become. We continually change. We seek rest. We seek satisfaction. God does none of those things. He never becomes anything new. He is changeless, he's enduring, he's constant, he's always the same. Would you hold your finger in Exodus 3, flip over to Psalm chapter 102, and let's just read toward the end of the chapter. Let's start reading at verse 25. Psalm 102, 25. Of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years have, uh, shall have no end. Thou art the same. Verse number 27 says, God doesn't change. In his book, The Knowledge of the Holy, A.W. Tozier, if I may paraphrase this, he talks about the changelessness of God, the fact that God doesn't change. Now stick with me. You learned why God's self-existence is important, right? In a moment, we'll talk about what the application is for us that God is changeless. Tozier, in The Knowledge of the Holy, says because God is change, because God is changeless, He never differs from himself. If God was ever different from himself or changed, he would have to do this in one of three ways. Now, this is really good. I didn't come up with it. A.W. Tozier did because he's smarter than I am. But I love the way he puts this. If God were going to change, he'd have to change in one of three ways. First, he would have to 
be from what he is now to something worse. He would have to change from what he is now to something worse. Or he would have to change from what he is now to something better. Or he would have to change from his present form to another. If God were going to change, he'd have to change in one of those three ways. He'd have to be something worse, he'd have to be something better, or he'd have to be in a different form. What does scripture say about those things? Scripture says none of those three are possible with God. That he cannot change to something better because he's eternally perfect. He cannot change to something worse because God is light and in him is no darkness at all. He cannot change from one form to another because James says in him there is no variableness or shadow of turning. God doesn't change. So what, what, is, what does that mean? That means that he is forever consistently himself. Always. The God that spoke audibly to Moses is absolutely no different today when he speaks to me through his Holy Spirit or he speaks through you to, through his Holy Spirit. He's the same God. He's not changed at all. The fact that God is unchanging in any way is the basis of our confidence that God will be faithful to his word when it comes to our salvation and the promise of eternal life. That's why the, the doctrine of God's immutability is important to you. He can't change. So if he said, call on the name of the Lord and thou shalt be saved, if he said that 2,000 years ago, he still honors that promise today because he doesn't change. If he says to Paul back in a, Philippian, or in a Roman jail somewhere, he says, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to provide all of your needs according to my riches and glory by Christ Jesus. If he says that to Paul 2,000 years ago, he's not going to change. He'll meet your need today. He can't change. He doesn't change. Have you ever heard that term before, acting out of character? You get somebody who is generally, they're even keeled, they're nice, they're pleasant to be around, and then one day they show up and they're just a jerk. They're short-tempered, they're biting, uh, they're, they're just, and you would say about that person, he or she is out of character. That's, that's, we would say something like this, that's just not like them. And you would suspect something is wrong with them. Why? Because they're out of character, right? God's never out of character. He's, he's immutable. He is unchanging in every way. His nature, who he is, is unchanging. Second, his purpose is unchanging. His purpose is unchanging. Numbers 23 verse 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? God's word is unchanging, and God's word describes his purpose. His purpose is unchanging. You can count on God's unchanging purpose, his unchanging word. Isaiah chapter, uh, Isaiah chapter 46 and verse number 8 says, remember this and show yourselves, men. Bring it again to mind, O ye transgressors. Remember the former things of old. For I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Here's verse 10, talking about God's purpose. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. His purpose doesn't change. Well, I did this in my life, and I, I veered off, and I, but God's purpose didn't change. Well, well, this happened, but God's purpose didn't change. His purpose is unchanging. What about those times in Scripture? Have you ever read those phrases in Scripture where it said God repented? It's not talking about repenting of sin. That word actually means to regret. You ever... I talk to people who, you know what I'm talking about? Some of you are just like, you're locked in, but you're not moving. 
There's, there's those passages of scripture that says, and it repented the Lord. Okay, so if God's purpose doesn't change, then when I come to 1 Samuel 15, and it said that it repented the Lord, and then just a few verses later, it says something about God doesn't repent or regret. How do I justify that? How, how do I get that? If, if God doesn't regret, if God's purpose doesn't change, if he did this, does he ever regret that? There's only one way I know to explain this, and it has to do with the limitations on your mind and my mind. God uses, go back to your, now this is going back to your grammar days in high school. For some of you, I know I'm asking you to take a very long journey here. Do you remember the phrase anthropomorphic? It is the assigning of human attributes to something that is not human. For example, we will use the phrase, in fact, it's in the scripture, isn't it? It'll say the hand of God. God doesn't have a hand. It'll talk about the eyes of God. So one of my favorite verses is 2 Chronicles 16, 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. But God doesn't have any eyes. So why does the Bible talk about the eyes of God or the hands of God? Why does the Bible say that God regrets when God doesn't regret because his, his purpose is unchanging? God uses, the Holy Spirit uses this grammatical tool called anthropomorphism to assign things to, to concepts that we couldn't naturally understand. The Bible says this about God, doesn't it? Does it say that God is a spirit? God doesn't exist in bodily form except in God the Son. But God the Father <coughs> doesn't have a body. He has no eyes. He has no hands. He is a spirit that is omniscient, omnip omnipotent, and omnipresent. He knows everything. He, just doesn't, he doesn't have eyes to do that. He just knows because he's God. So when the Bible says that God repented of this or, or repented of that, it's not talking about he regretted what he did. He's just putting it in terms that what he did, uh, what he did caused disconsternation on our part. For example, God told, I'll give, here's the example. God told um, Samuel, to anoint Israel's first king. What was his name? Saul. Who told Samuel to anoint Saul? God did. Then why does it say that it repented the Lord that Saul was anointed? Why is that? It's because of the results that came about for the nation of Israel and the heartache he caused, but it was all part of God's purpose. God doesn't regret anything he's done. God has no guilt. God doesn't repent. Do you know why? Because his purpose is perfect and it's unchanging. I told you we're going to flip some breakers here today. Let's keep flipping them. His purpose is unchanging. God is unchanging in his character, his purpose, his ways, his nature. This is his immutability. All of these attributes, they come together together. And so what, 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 is that, what does that do for me that God is unchanging? I just wrote this down, and then we're going to move to our last point. In the midst of so much uncertainty in this life, personal health issues, aging parents, political strife, cultural upheaval, marital struggles, financial questions, the thing that should sustain you and I is the vision of the God who never changes. He's always the same. He's always himself. And if he promised, if he promised to take care of us in the Bible thousands of years ago, you can bank on that promise in 2021. He's the God who doesn't change. He's self-existent. He's unchanging. And the last thing we'll talk about today, and thank the Lord for it, God is faithful to his people and to his promises. God's faithful to his people and to his promises. Now, this faithfulness is the outflow of God's self-existence and his unchangeable nature. What does faithful mean? 
in its, in its purest, in, in its purest uh, form, faithful just means stick to it. You stay the course. If you make a marriage vow, you keep that marriage vow. If you make a faith promise, you keep that promise. You're faithful. It, it means to stick to it. Like everything else, in God's faithfulness, he is absolutely perfect. I started praying years ago. God, help me to be faithful to you like you are to me. Now, I'm never going to realize that until I get to heaven. But I want my faithfulness to God to grow in the direction of perfection. I'm not going to be perfectly faithful to God. But he is perfectly faithful to you and I. He's faithful to his people, faithful to his promises. What is it that, when you boil it down, what is it God's doing in Exodus chapter 3? When he pulls Moses aside with this burning bush and Moses goes, i got to go look at that burning bush over there because it's on fire but it's not burning up. And he goes over there. What is it that God is doing? He's telling Moses to tell Israel that he's going to be faithful to the covenant he made with Abraham back in Genesis chapter number 15. That's all he's doing. He is proclaiming and being the faithful God that he is. All he's doing in Exodus 3 is demonstrating his faithfulness. Look at verse, are you back in Exodus chapter 3? If you are, look at verse number 16. 3.16 says, Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say unto them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, appeared unto me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you out of the, up out of the affliction of Egypt unto the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites unto a land flowing with milk and honey. In those two verses... God is saying, this is what he's giving Moses this commission. God is saying to them, tell them I'm going to be faithful to the covenant I made with their fathers and even with their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There's a, a Dutch theologian by the name of Herman Bavink, and he said this, and I, I, I thought this was a good observation. It is not a new and strange God who comes to them by way of Moses but the God of the fathers, the unchangeable one, the faithful one, the eternally consistent one who never leaves or forsakes his people. He is unchangeable in his grace, in his love, in his assistance, who will be what is because he is always himself. What is he? He's faithful. He's always going to be. Our, our hope in this this changing world has to be in an unchanging God. I, I, know the, I know the country's about to get crazy when we start this political season and it starts to get, it starts to get revved up. I know the country's going to go crazy. You know the country's going to go crazy. God's not going to change one bit over the next nine months. He's not going to change at all. His eternal faithfulness is proclaimed all through Scripture. May I remind you of some of those in Exodus 34, verse number 6, God, when he was revealing his glory, we were in this chapter at the very beginning of our series, when he's revealing his glory to Moses, Exodus 34, 6, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and in truth. Psalm chapter 89, verse 33, Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. Lamentations 3.23. We sang this hymn this morning, didn't we? Great is thy faithfulness. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5. We count on this verse more often than we, can we, than we can remember. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. God's proclaiming his faithfulness. It's eternal. It's, it's everything that it should be. He's declaring his faithfulness. That faithfulness is why you and I take comfort when we're burying our loved ones. God didn't change. He's still faithful. So let's wrap this up. Here's a, here's a, a final truth in closing this morning. Ready? Everything said about God this morning is true of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
a steal from Brenda's song, that's him. Jesus is self-existent. Jesus is unchanging. Jesus is always faithful. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the eternal, self-existent God. Look quickly with me, if you would, at John chapter, at John chapter 8. This is, the, this is the last place I'll ask you to turn, all right? You might be already be familiar with this, this occurrence between Jesus and the religious Jews. But Jesus is talking to Pharisees and scribes and to others who are opposing him. And in, in John chapter 8 and verse number 56, he's talking to them, and this is what he said. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. Abraham loved me. That's what he's saying. And those Pharisees and the scribes and those religious opposers in verse number 57. Then said the Jews unto Jesus, thou art not yet 50 years old. And hast thou seen Abraham? Here it comes. Well, you shouldn't have asked that question. You grabbed the wrong tiger by the tail right here. Verse 58. Jesus said unto them, verily... Verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. God always has existed, past, present, and future. Grammatically, he should have said there, before Abraham was, I was. But he didn't. He said, before Abraham was, I am. One of our very first passages of scripture we looked at in this series was Hebrews chapter 1, the first three verses, where Jesus is called the express image of God. Everything we have said that's true of God the Father is true of Jesus Christ this morning. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In Revelation chapter 1, verses 17 and 18, John writes this, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not. And he lays out three I am statements to John in Revelation chapter 1. He says, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. Everything that we've said that's true of God today is true of the Lord Jesus Christ. You live in a changing uncertain, unpredictable world as far as your perspective. You and I cannot know. We are not to boast ourselves of tomorrow because we know not what a day may bring forth. But we serve a God who is self-existent. He's eternal and unchanging and he's faithful. And because of those things, we can know exactly who holds the days ahead? It is appointed unto men once to die. That's appointed. It's coming. There is nothing we can do about that. What's the answer? The gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the answer. The one person, the one being in all of the universe, the eternal, self-existent, unchanging, faithful God, the great I am, he has made himself known through the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. It's through Jesus Christ. The life you're living today, it's transitory. It's temporal. The body you're in, it's a tent. It is a temporary residence. But God has made it possible for us to dwell with him and in his presence and in his fellowship for eternity. And he's done that through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. For the lost person, you ought to come to him today. Everything, if you're not here, if you're here today rather and you're not saved, everything I've said today is absolutely true. Not because of some words of this preacher or other preachers, but because of the words of, the, of God. What scripture has to say. This is the God. Whether or not we believe it. This is the God with whom we have to do. Come to him today if you're not saved. If you are saved today. This is the God who is your comfort. 
and your tower and your refuge, all of those things that David called him back in, in Psalm chapter number 40. He's your strong tower. He's your defense. He's a wonderful place to flee to. This is the God who is. He is self-existent. He is unchangeable. And he is absolutely and perfectly faithful to everything that he said he would be. Come to him. Trust in him. Christians, rest in him. No trial you or I face can overcome a God like that. It's just not going to happen. Let's stand together, can we? Father, we come to you in prayer this morning, and we recognize your greatness. We recognize your mercy, and all these things that we talked about you today, we're talking about things that are beyond our ability to understand, beyond my ability to explain. But Lord, your word is truth, and we get it from your word. We're so thankful that you have chosen to reveal yourself the way you have. And God, in this world of trial and uncertainty, of heartache and betrayal, of sin and perversion, when right is called wrong and wrong is called right, we can flee into your presence, coming boldly as your children because we've been invited there. And we can find refuge and we can find wisdom and we can find understanding and we can gain the, the perspective that we need from an eternally existent, unchanging, faithful God. So Lord, today, do your work in our hearts. I need to be changed because of what I've learned in this message. Folks in here need to be changed and different because of what we've learned. Our worry level ought to go down. Lord, we can trust in you and rest in you. Whatever your work is in our hearts, please do it. I pray in your name. Amen. Would you please hold your heads bowed for just a few moments? I don't know what you need to come and give to the Lord today. I don't know what messages about self-existence and immutability and faithfulness. I don't know what those have to do with you today. But you know. God knows. Would you come today and let him have that part of you that needs to be reassured or needs to trust or needs to rest? Whatever God might be doing in your heart, you come this morning, would you? Amen. Thank you. You can look up this way. I appreciate your attention this morning. I, I'm glad you're here. It's good to see each one of you here. And I hope you'll come back tonight. Will you? You're, you'll be encouraged by what, what God is doing in the Philippines and what God allowed Brother John to see and participate in. And I hope you'll be with, with us back tonight. It'll be a good, good meeting. Brother Frank Brown's coming, and he's going to um, 
just go over some of these um, announcements this afternoon uh, and then, well, still morning. Yeah, I'm still in the morning. Good. I had 20 more minutes before we had to be out of here. <laughs> Brother Frank's coming, then he's going to dismiss you in prayer and then see our ladies, would you, from the hearts and hands. They're waiting for you at the doors. They've got a, they've got a love gift for you this morning and I hope you'll, uh, I hope you're encouraged by it. God bless you, church. I'll use those 20 minutes. <laughs> Have a seat. <laughs> I hear some. No, Frank, stop. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Thank you. I want to share a couple of things with you. Uh, men's pizza and game night. Uh, that's this Friday night at 630. Sign up to information table back here on the left-hand side of the foyer. Ladies Fellowship, uh, Saturday at 10 a.m. Sign up at, again at our information table. Uh, teens uh, mini miniature golf and escape room. Uh, I don't know what escape room is, but anyway, well, uh, leaving church at 6 p.m. So uh, that is a cost. And see your uh, your bulletin. It says something about the cost there. Uh, business meeting to, uh, uh, to approve the budget. That's next Sunday at 5 p.m. So please uh, attend that service. Uh, that. That business meeting is very important that you hear the uh, budget for next year and uh, you have some say in that, how that works. So uh, please be here that uh, next Sunday for that at 5 p.m. Global Focus on uh, 2024, that's Friday. Uh, it starts uh, the 21st and 25th. Uh, you'll need to sign up with our lunchings at that, those dates. So again, at the table in the back on the left, uh, the information table, sign up for that, uh, and, and we hope that a number of you will volunteer, not only volunteer, but make an effort to be here for that global focus. That's, a, that's an important service and important challenge for our church. Uh, first time visitors, Mark and, uh, and Terry will be here on the right hand side at the, uh, at the uh, east end of our, our foyer to, to uh, meet our visitors. So please stop just for a second to say, them, uh, say hi to them and let them uh, know who you are, that they can have a chance to visit with you just for a few minutes. Uh, thank you so much. Let me, uh, I didn't take 20 minutes, folks. I still got 15, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you. Let us pray. Our dear God, we thank you for this time, this fellowship. Be with us in the afternoon. Be with us uh, that we be safe traveling home and that um, you bring us back here again to worship and and praise and give you thanks for all that we are in Christ Jesus. Now we ask these things in Christ's name for his sake. Amen and amen.